Okay. Um, does everyone know where Golden Sunlight is? Uh, everyone pretty close to here. Um, I've been there for a little over two years. Um, I worked in Nevada for about 10 years down in northern Nevada, and then I did a little stint in the oil and gas industry, which was um, interesting. I, I prefer mining, but um, that's a little about me. Um, the first thing I'd like to show is a video our geologists put together, and it just it just kind of shows you uh, where where we're at and um, some of the projects we have because we're always on that uh, brink of closing, and um, we have some exciting projects that will push our mine light out uh, mine life out a few years. So I'll, I'll just start with that. It's about three minutes. It's it's really well put together. So enjoy it. Eric, Golden Sunlight is pleased to present its U.S. gold mining and processing operation. Located in southwest Montana, 55 kilometers east of Butte, on the flank of Bull Mountain, Golden Sunlight has been mined by open pit and underground methods. Current mining is underground only by long bolt open scoping. Production is 1,500 to 2,000 tons per day. Ore treatment uses carbon in pulp and sand tailing retreatment technology. The mill can process 7,000 tons per day. Over 3.5 million ounces of gold has been produced since commissioning in 1983. This plan view shows geology units and soil gold. Sampling between Mineral Hill and Apex in 2016 has identified new exploration opportunities. All drilling is shown here. Over 3,500 holes have been drilled focused on Mineral Hill to the south and Apex to the north. Zooming into Tubug, we see Mineral Hill Brescia, a 200 meter diameter Brescia pipe plunging west. The open pit shows what has been mined from surface and what remains underground. Faults in blue are the corridor fault and the west shear recently found to offset the Brescia. Past mine workings are shown in green. Current development is blue. Mining in 2016 was above and below the West Shear, along which the West High Wall is failing. Portals 1 and 3 are on the east side of the pit to provide safe access for the miners. 2016 scopes are shown here. Over 492,000 tons, grading 2.7 gram per ton, has been mined. Scoping in 2017 includes the Lone Eagle and Baja Cabo areas and west transverse scopes. Over 486,000 tons, grading 3.1 gram per ton, is scheduled for production in 2017. Rotating to the southeast cross section, we see the West Shear offsetting Russia, mining above and below the West Shear at geology units. Exploration in 2016 tested targets below and above the West Shear. With success, more drilling will refine the grade and shape of ore. Zooming into Apex and the potential for an underground mine, we see surface geology, golden soils, and rotating to a cross section looking east, the gold bearing Grayson and Flathead formations. All drilling is shown here with a 1.7 gram per ton gold cutoff block model. Within this model, scopes were built at a 2.6 gram per ton gold cutoff. Some stoves have adequate drilling, others need drilling for confirmation. Initial drilling in red targets shallower stoves. Later drilling in green completes the shallow testing and tests deeper targets. Geotechnical drilling will evaluate the access drifts for rock confidence and test perspective zones recently discovered. Okay, so this is uh, my presentation. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, some of the mine reclamation we've done over the probably the past 20 so years. Um, I just took this project over two years ago. As many of you know, we, had a, we stopped surface mining. We had a big force reduction and um, my predecessor retired. So he uh, he's should have most of the credit for the good work that's gone, gone on out there. So. 
So this is uh, just a summary of our um, main reclamation areas. Probably the largest is the West Dump. Um, that's the steep area. It's two to one. Um, uh, pretty pretty long slope there. Uh, then we have what we call the East Dump area. This is a per, this is probably eighty percent reclaimed. There's some area right here in the top area that has not been reclaimed yet. Um, then we have the East Dump area, which is this this area right here, and that's probably 65, 70% reclaimed. We still have uh, this whole top section here. Um, we just reclaimed a slice here uh, this year, and we're actually seeding it right this week. Um, and then we have this uh, kind of ugly center section here that we still need to uh, complete. Uh, then we have our Far East dump, which is 0% uh, Reclaimed, it's still an active waste dump. We're not using it right now since we stopped surface mining, but um, uh, that's, that's an area we need to work on if, if, we, if we don't use it anymore. Then we have the buttress dump. Um, this, uh, this area is probably, again, 60% reclaimed. There's a top area here um, that's not going to reclaimed. The all the slopes are reclaimed around the sides of it. Um, and that's an area that we're really looking at next year as a target to. Uh, to, to, uh, to start the, uh, reclaiming that top area there. Then we have uh, the south dump um, in the intra dumps right here. Um, that's reclaimed. It's kind of a, I'll, I'll show you some more pictures that we'd like to get. That's one area we really like to get some trees growing because you can see these trees are right here. And then we call it infamously, like notoriously, the Hoover Dam because it just, it just doesn't look like it fits in there. So, but we would like to get some trees kind of blended in there if we can. Um, and then uh, this is our tailing stor storage facility number one. It's closed. It's pretty much 100% uh, reclaimed. We're actually grazing cattle out there. Um, so it's, we're kind of showing post mining use of what the property could be used for when the, uh, when the mine closes. And then this is our tailing, uh, the active tailing storage facility number two. Of course, it's not reclaimed. It's still in use. So. Uh, this is well before my time, but um, maybe, what was it, 20 years ago, Joan? Um, we received permission to do uh, two to one reclamation on our west slope, and it was basically at our own risk. Um, the, um, the advantage is, is that that's a steeper terrain area, so it does match the existing terrain. Um, of course, the economics of pushing a slope to two to one versus three to one is, it's much cheaper. Um, and then we had limited footprint. The, the, mine, the mine boundary is right up against the, the toe of that area. So we, we really didn't have the opportunity to push it out that far. Um, so the challenges that I came across with that is equipment capabilities and the operator capabilities. It's, uh, you know, at that steep a slope, it's, it's dangerous to operate a, a dozer on there. So you have to have very qualified and very capable operators. And then you also, we also developed a counterweight that goes on the back of the dozer that allows the dozer to back up the slope. Um, another uh, another uh, challenge is uh, erosion control. When you have that long a slope and that steep, you can get a lot of velocity from the, um, from, our, from if you have a good storm. And so, uh, you know, you, you spend millions of dollars putting all that soil and and that and then it washes it away and you got to do it again so that um you know that's a risk um and then uh so that's kind of goes along with the economics of failure and then the soil thickness on the on the two to ones we're required to put 36 inches of topsoil and then on the like the three to ones it's only 31 inches um and you might not think seven inches of difference but when you start hauling millions and millions of yards it's, it's millions and millions of dollars so um and then uh, the other challenge, and this just isn't on that area, is conifer recruitment. We just have trouble growing trees on our, the grasses grow great. We have great cover on the grasses and even some shrubs, but the, we can't get trees to grow. And that's kind of where Robert's gonna help us. And what we're thinking is that it's, uh, the grasses are using all the water. And then we have so many deer on the property that we think maybe they're, they're uh, just eating these seedlings before they can even get, get established. So these are the basic steps to um, reclaim a steep slope and I'll go into each one um, a little more detail. So uh, the most important is engineering design. If you, if you design it a dump while you're 
before you even make the dump, it, it, you can save so much money in the long run. I, I mean, I see it with our older dumps trying to reclaim it. It's, the cost of pushing is so much if you just take the extra time and thought to engineer it and design it correctly. And then, uh, then of course, after you, uh, the uh, dozer pushing, of course, uh, then the topsoil haul, you want to stock pile, pile that topsoil that, uh, from that footprint, then you haul it to the top. Then the application and pushing, or the topsoil application. Then uh, for the steeper channels, the diversion channels, we'll rip wrap them to prevent erosion. Um, and then we also install our stormwater basins at the below the dump. We don't want any water from our property running off the property, getting down to the Jefferson or the Boulder River, or there's a lot of alfalfa fields or farmers or, or whatnot. We, we can keep pretty much all our, uh, we build them big enough to keep all our stormwater on the property. Uh, then we do compost application, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the challenges we see with that later. Um, then uh, sometimes we do dozer tracking after that. It, it kind of uh, solidifies the compost and also uh, prevents erosion from because you got that parallel tracking across the slope, especially during those first few years. Then. Uh, of course, we'll do the seeding and fertilizer at the same time. Um, that's what we're doing yesterday and tomorrow. Um, dozer divots, and those are, those are something that we came up with. I'll, I'll go into that a little later. It's really worked out good, we think. And then uh, the diversion channel and berm's final construction. And then we come back, hand seed those dozer divots and uh, the diversion channels, and then continual weed control and monitoring of the dump of the, of the success. I think my the top of my slide's not showing there. I don't know. Is it? Uh, I think the thing's tilted down a little. Or what is the setting with the? Sorry. It's I can get through it if you. It's showing up greatly on the screen. So actually, the and we don't have the remote control. I turn it on. That's all right, I can adapt. Okay, so uh, the top of the slide is supposed to say engineering design. Like I said, this is the most important uh, step to saving money or having a natural looking uh, reclamation project. Uh, so get, like I said, re removal of the topsoil uh, stockpile and you gotta really think of where you put it because the haul up to the top cost a lot of money. You're gonna hear me say cost a lot of money a lot because this is this it, this is expensive work. Um, then design of the waste rock footprint. Um, DQ BLM have their input on on uh, or the permitting process does. Um, it can significantly reduce the, those are pushing costs if you design the dump correctly. And then um, it's just a key to natural topography. I have some pictures later on of early, what we did early, and then what we did later, and it, it just looks so much better when you have a natural rolling topography rather than some pyramid or, or square, square shaped thing. Um, so prior to dozing, uh, dozer pushing, we get the accurate slope aspect. This was a lot harder before technology. Now we have GPS's and the dozers that, that tells the operator what, what to put, what area to push, what to not push, so it's a lot easier. Now, before it was, it was tougher. Um, and then we, uh, hopefully you design, you design the dump to have the diversion channels, but if not, you have to build them. And then uh, we'll, we'll put those stormwater BMPs to prevent discharge and then uh, topsoil erosion. So this is, the slide is supposed to say historic design. So this is like a historic, whoops, historic design. Um, you can just see it's just squared off here. Uh, it doesn't match in with the rolling of the hills, you know, it, it just doesn't, I mean, it grows grass the same, but it just doesn't look as appealing. And then this is, this is a, something we've done later. You can see, you know, the rolling contours, the top's not squared off, it matches with the, with the hills. So, you know, besides the, the diversion ditches, which are necessary to keep the water from infiltrating the dumps, it, it, it'll look pretty natural. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and stop me. Sure, go ahead. Do you use heavy equipment to do that? Oh yeah, uh, D10s. So what does that do for plant growth if you're compacting the dirt? Um, it's fine. Um, 
the cedar will have like a harrow behind it to to um, put the seed in. So, and we, we want it compact. We don't want water getting into the dump. That's the whole purpose of the cap because uh, we're trying to prevent the acid rock drainage from coming out that toe of the dump. So, we, we want it compact. Other than, other than clear advantage of aesthetics, is there any other advantages to this rolling uh, topography that you're doing? Um, no, it costs more. Yeah. <laughs> but are not that much more if you, if you design it right from the beginning. It looks much better. Are, are you required to do it or are you doing it because you think it's the right thing? Uh, I, I don't know, but I think it's required nowadays, right, Joan? Or it's a trend towards it. Yeah, but I think we, we, we do it anyways because we, we, we want to look at it and be proud of it too, you know, instead of... Oh, sure. I think one of the ideas is it can help with runoff, too, is it'll be more natural runoff. Yeah. And but I haven't really seen that. So after, uh, after you're done with the dump, the next, the next, uh, the next phase is dozer pushing. And this is on our west side. Um, you can you can just see the amount of material that, that is required to uh, push. I mean, it just takes months. Here's a bigger picture of that. So that that's the two to one there. Um, that's the steepest that that we're allowed to do on that section. So and then you have the topsoil hall, and like I said, that that takes that's a very significant event, uh, expense um, hauling that topsoil. Sure. So is that is that uh, really coarse material at the foot? Yeah, the the bigger boulders will roll, of course, when they're when they're pushing the the soil or the. Oh, okay. The, so when they're when they're doing this, you know, the bigger bowl, boulders tend to roll to the bottom and, okay. and get down there. Yeah. So, but there's different size material in the in the in the waste that rock dump. Been covered yet. That's not no, that's that's just that's the waste the waste rock dump. Yep. Okay. I thought maybe that was a grain field as No, no. So like I said, topsoil haul, a, a lot of expense there. Um, you're just hauling from topsoil from the stock pole on the bottom all the way to the top, and hopefully you have enough. And topsoil pushing. We've had uh, problems in the past where we didn't have the GPS technology that we do now. Um, they can get it within inches of our requirements now. But in the past, we have thin areas, and then we have to come in and redo them. So, but but now with the technology, we can the dozer just it just tells them what to do. So it's very. Then our stormwater controls. Um, this is an area that we just did this summer. Um, so we're rip, we're gonna filter uh, put filter cloth down this channel, and then we'll rip wrap it. We rip wrap all those channels that are steeper because they'll, otherwise they'll just wash out and go right back down to the waste rock dump. We, we want to protect, we don't want water getting into the waste rock dump. And then uh, we'll have our basins at the bottom. And we design these basins so they can uh, withstand a, uh, like a 10 year storm. So basically that's a little over two inches in a 24 hour period. And we, we construct them even larger. They're a lot of volume. So I talked about compost. The next step is compost app application. And uh, that's to give you know, some nutrients to the new, uh, new seedlings. Um, our vegetation consultant um, thinks that the compost is aiding the weeds more than the native species. So this year, this is at uh, nine acre, I don't know if I talked about this, but we did, this is the area we did this year. It's about nine or 10 acres. And we uh, are doing a test. DQ gave us because DQ gave us permission to do a test here. This half will not have compost, and this half will. And then we'll monitor it. And then if we have success without the compost, we can submit um, a request to DQ and BLM um, to not use compost. But we, they, they, they want us to prove it first. So, uh, but our vegetation co consultant. Uh, we have a lot of problems with kochia in the early years uh, establishing itself, 
they think that kochia is feeding on those nutrients. So if we don't give them the nutrients, then it won't, won't be as uh, prolific. This is a uh, dozer tracking. You can't really see it too well here. Um, but then you're, you're kind of bedding the compost and you're, that first couple years is where you have the erosion problems. Once the, once the grasses get established, we don't see problems with erosion, but it's that first couple years. So we're trying to create that parallel uh, line so the water doesn't get those long runs. You know, it has to go over the dozer tracks and they're, they're about two inches deep. Seeding, I took this picture yesterday. So uh, we, uh, we have a contractor that has a snow cat. That, that way it's a little bit safer on the uh, steep slopes. Ideally, you would, you would see parallel, um, again, to have the lines parallel to the uh, slope to break up the water. But just, it, we just feel it's safer to go up and down and, that, and safety is number one at the mine. So we go up and, we go up and down. Or, well, I don't know what the right word is, but. Uh, and this is our seed mix. Um, it's approved by uh, DEQ and BLM. Um, we call this our west, west side, south facing steep slope seed mix. Um, I'll just read off. Uh, we have blue bunch wheatgrass, Canadian wild rye, thick spike wheatgrass, stream bank wheatgrass, intermediate wheatgrass, slender wheatgrass, needle and thread. For Forbes, we have yarrow, sweet clover. Really the only one we see successful is alfalfa. See a lot of alfalfa. Um, but it's in the beginning. It kind of seems to regress as, uh, as, as 10 years of growing, maybe, you know. Then for shrubs, we have fringe sage wort, rabbit brush, sage brush, and then four wing. So uh, dozer divots. Um, this is something my predecessor pioneered in the early 2000s. Um, it's really worked well for us. Uh, it's, they're, here's a picture of them. So you can see they're, they're offset to prevent erosion. So the theory is, is when um, the, water, the water comes down, it fills up this little divot. They're, they're maybe a foot deep and then it spills over and then it comes over to this one and it really helps keep the top soil in place and prevent erosion. But I think the excellent benefit is it creates these microclimates of uh, more water, you know, in there and that uh, different types of vegetation grow. Instead of just having like a monoculture, it creates a, a you know, um, I'll show you a picture later and, and it's just a little lusher in there is what we're finding. And also it, there's a little aspect change. So especially on our west or south facing dumps, you have that little north facing uh, aspect on the, on the back side of the divot. Uh, give you some more moisture. Oh wait. So uh, the next step is diversion channels. Uh, so these are already built into design, hopefully. Um, but we already pushed topsoil over them. They, right now, they kind of just look like a, when the slope is like this, it kind of rolls out maybe 20, 30 feet and then drops down. But what we do here is we, uh, after we seed, we come in with a clay bento mat liner, it's 15 feet wide, and we roll it along the whole diversion channel. Now these diversion channels are sloped they're all the way to one side of the dump. We do not want water pooling on the dump because we don't want water getting inside the dump. And then, uh, and then what we'll do is they'll build a berm up on the outside of the, the channel. So that water runs along the mat. The mat keeps the water from going in the dump and it runs off the dump before it infiltrates. And then we have to come back since we disturbed it after we seeded it, we have to come back and hand seed it. And, and same with the do those dozer divots. So, I couldn't find a picture of us hand seeding, so I kind of just stole this one off the internet. So. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we'll come back and hand seed the, the dozer divots and the uh, diversion channels. So do you, do you seed the slope first, then, then the dozer, dozer divots, then go back in? And exactly. Okay. Yep. And then, so that's basically you're done with the construction there. Now there's always maintenance coming back. It, it was especially the first couple of years, you might get a big storm. You need to retract some, uh, if you have some uh, water runoff channels or whatnot. Um, but um, once we get, you know, once we get to like three or four years and that vegetation really takes good, uh, good hold, we don't see erosion problems, any, many erosion problems. So 
hopefully we don't get that storm that dumps two inches in an hour or something. But so vegetation monitoring, um, we're using Cedar Creek Associates right now. Um, they're out of Colorado, and they have this. Uh, they kind of developed this uh, laser uh, monitoring technique where they there's ten lasers on 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 this tripod mounted bar, and what they what they do is uh, uh, they see what each laser is hitting, and that way it takes the objectivity out. The old way when I when I did it uh, in my post college days was you lay a line out for 100 feet and you kind of go long. But if you have two people do it, you're gonna have com way different results. So this takes the objectivity out of it. So what they're doing is they move this thing 10 times down the row, and then they have 100 points, and that gives you a percent cover. So it takes the uh, and then they do. 20, 30 on each, on each uh, area. So it takes the objectivity out of it. And uh, this is from last year, last summer when they were out. Um, our reference areas, they run about 27%. That's areas that the mine hasn't touched, but they're kind of near, similar uh, topography, similar aspect um, to, the, to the ones that, to the comparable ones. The success criteria in Montana is not really established, but in Nevada, it's 75% of the average of the reference tables, so that'd be 20%. And then you can see where we're at. We're at uh, buttress dump, 49%. The extension isn't doing so well, uh, but uh, east dump, west dump, almost 50%. Um, this is just a section of cheat grass they did. Uh, and then the south dump is 35%. So we're well above the, uh, the uh, reference areas percent cover. If we could just get trees to grow, we'd be happy. And uh, as far as the, uh, I, ju I just took an average here of what they're, uh, so different slopes have different species that kind of seem to dominate. Um, but this is just an average of all our areas. Uh, so. Alfalfa had 11.3%, thick spike regrass 8.8%, uh, blue bunch 5.2%. These ones we don't want. These are uh, kochia and sheatgrass. We, um, we're, we're try the kochia comes in early, um, but it kind of peters out, like I said. And then, but the cheatgrass comes in later, and that's something we really fight. And then we have uh, just some 2.5, you know, below 2.5% wheatgrass, sheep fescue, Russian wild wild, and western wheatgrass. So wildlife, if any of you have ever been out the Golden Sunlight, it's hard pressed not to see a deer. We have, at any time, I do a deer count every spring and summer, or fall for uh, FWP, and there's usually about 100 deer using the property. Um, they love the dumps, there's a lot of groceries there. I don't see them anywhere else on the property, but I only see them on the reclamation, so. Um, we have elk usually coming during the hunting season for protection, I think, and then they come in, they kind of um, in and out during the fall and winter. And then uh, we have a few antelope, a lot of coyotes, we see mountain lions or every once in a while, a um, lot of raptors on the dumps. Um, they like that area where the wind comes up and they kind of just hover over there and, uh, and take advantage of all the rodents. And then uh, we also see the occasional black bear. So here's some challenges that we have. Um, uh, we have this is on the south inter dump or above the south dump. We have a line here of uh, steam vents. There's 13 steam vents, is what I counted last winter. They're hard to see in the summer, so we go look at them in the winter. This is like minus 10 or something when we went and looked at this, and. Uh, we don't know exactly what caused it, but what it is is the dump is hot and it's venting out these areas. The cap isn't sufficient. Um, what we think maybe happened is that the dump got compacted along this line and then some coarser material was dumped over it and it's kind of leading like a conduit out to this line area. Um, right now we're just watching it, but um, and they're not growing or shrinking. They're just, they're just kind of the same. Um, Eventually, we'll probably have to uh, recap that area. Um, we're just kind of letting it vent before, uh, hopefully, it'll dissipate. 
So stormwater damage, I already, I already kind of stressed that the first few years, you can, this one's kind of hard to see, but you can see the roll, uh, the channels that, that the, uh, it, it creates like after a, a, a rain when you don't have that grass there to protect it and, uh, and, and divert the water. Even, you can see how it goes into the dozer divots here, but this one kind of missed, uh, missed right here. So those are its help, but they don't, they don't totally protect everything. And then acid rock drainage. This isn't from our mine. I stole this one against from the internet, but um, this is what we're trying to prevent with that cap. We don't, we don't see any acid rock drainage off our reclaimed slopes. We do have some unreclaimed areas that we see some, a, a small bit of acid rock drainage, but we have it contained. Um, it's very small amount, um, but we don't see any off our, re, our, our reclaimed areas. And that's, that's what that 31 to 36 inches of cap is there to prevent. And then weed control. Um, so this is, this is our butcher stump. That's where I mentioned we had that kochia infestation. And usually the kochia, you know, we have a problem and then it kind of dissipates. But this area just got like 100% kochia. It's probably like 18 acres. So <coughs> finally, after a few years, we just burned it and started over. And, um, and then weed contractors, we spend probably 30, 40 grand a year uh, fighting weeds. And not just on the, on the uh, reclamation, but all over the mine. It's just, it's just a problem. Um, I think all the ranchers in the valley have the same problem. The main weeds uh, for the reclamation that we're concerned about are cheatgrass and kochia, I already mentioned that. But we also have patches of white top. Um, but we're pretty successful controlling the white top. The, the cheatgrass is our, our primary concern right now. So uh, tree and shrub recruitment. Here's a picture of that uh, south dump or what we call the Hoover Dam. You can see it just, it just doesn't look right, right? If you're driving on the highway looking up at the mine, it, it, it's not pretty. So you can see all the trees right here and trees on this slope. And so we'd like to get some trees growing in here and break it up a little bit better, you know. And then here's a picture of Robert and it was Jared, right? Jared, yeah. Um, we put this, was it October or November that we did this? October. October. So we went out and uh, did 25 uh, plots, mainly, and we kind of concentrated on those does or divots because we thought that would give them the best success with a little more water. And we did bitter brush, rabbit brush, sage brush, pinion juniper, and lodgepole. 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 So, and then one. Doctor. Yeah, I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that, or? I mean, we're just actually now trying uh, a fall and the spring planting here, which is very limited numbers of plants, just hundred. It, it just um, stalling. And actually, what we are like about it is that Jerry already mentioned that those are the bits. It's the technique that we really like. It's almost like a rough and loose technique, and and. I think it would be very beneficial, and if we will see no success there, there would be really little chance to see it somewhere else. And one of our big, I think, enemies would be probably deer. Uh, we we actually checked them after a couple of weeks after planting, and they were still intact. So we are hopeful, and, and next week we are trying to go out and do something, maybe use some repellents mm -hmm. or just to teach them they're not food, but for the long term, I don't know how good they're, <laughs> they can be trained. And <clears throat> yeah, so we just would like to have a diversity of shrubs and trees and uh, see what works best and hopefully this guy.